welcome. Thank you so much, uh, both to people that are here with us and in online. We are receiving Professor Karajnik from uh, University of Law Oslo, and we thank him so much for this uh, discussion and presentation and opportunity to learn. He is a um, uh, professor of political science and researcher, and he is one of the members who has done a, a study that is incredibly challenging for us concerning uh, the role of social movements and uh, organized labor. Uh, it's a global study, which is so it's a very wide and uh, broad study and uh, the consequences of these uh, uh, sectors to democracy. We believe that this is a key debate nowadays, uh, which, uh, as you will learn through this uh, uh, presentation, um, questioning is, uh, was able to question a lot of a common sense that we have concerning the relation of labor movement with politics. So we thank him so much for this opportunity. Professor. Thank you so much for the very kind uh, presentation and, and thanks also for inviting me here. So um, I'm very pleased uh, not only to be here in Lisbon, this, this fantastic, uh, fantastic city and, and talk about my, my research, uh, but also for the opportunity to, to talk about these, these questions on uh, the role of different social movements and how kind of big mass mobilization movements, uh, different characteristics of these movements can have consequences for long term uh, political change and, and especially for democratization. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the study that, uh, that, that Raquel mentioned, uh, but also uh, a couple of ongoing projects that I have with other colleagues that relate somewhat to, to this broader question on, on, on social mobilization. So I call this uh, presentation mass, mass Opposition Movements and Democratization Since the French uh, Revolution. So uh, in the main study that I'm going to talk about, we, we draw on data going back to 1900. Um, and then we haven't done a study on uh, the democratizing role of mass opposition movements since the French Revolution. But um, we are now collecting data on these historical uh, opposition movements. Uh, I think, for example, about the French revolutions of 1789 and 1848. So we're, we're looking into and collecting data for these, um, uh, these opposition movements. And I'm going to present some of these data um, that we are very soon releasing. Let's see. Okay, so uh, the topics of today, it's going to be a collection of, uh, of related topics. The first one is, is the question what we actually know about mass opposition movements um, and democratization from existing studies. And I've then uh, posted in, um, in parentheses here um, on post-1900 data, because most of the studies that have been conducted on opposition movements and, um, and democratization have drawn on especially the fantastic data from Eric, uh, Erika Chenoweth and colleagues, the Navco data, which extend back to 1900. Then I'm going to uh, talk about this particular study uh, that uh, Siriane Dalum, Tore Vig, uh, and I uh, published in 2019, where we looked at these uh, uh, mass mobilization movements and coded which particular social groups, so be it peasants, uh, military employees, uh, uh, large-scale landowners, or the urban middle classes or urban industrial workers, so which of these groups are uh, participating in and dominating these social movements, and does that matter for uh, democratization after the movement is finished? And, and the, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about, uh, do some commercial for, for these uh, post-1789 uh, data that we're collecting on opposition movements across the world, which is a massive data collection project uh, involving several uh, large, uh, large projects that have come together and finance um, data collection on approximately uh, 1,500 uh, mass mobilization movements in 1789 across the world. Okay, so just, just to uh, set the stage here. So if we, um, if we look at, um, uh, we, we take a very kind of bird's eye view and think of all the countries in the world and, and long kind of, you measure them every, every year. So let's think that you, you look into, for example, France right now or Portugal right now or Norway right now, and then you register whether there is a sustained mass mobilization movement in opposition to, to the political regime that's that's ongoing, and you code that for all countries. 
if you do that um, and uh, you look at mass opposition movements when they exist, you will tend to see a systematic pattern in the in the data. So for these years that have these sustained large scale mass opposition movements, you tend to see increased chances of democratization uh, a few years down the line. So this is not kind of this is not anything revolutionary in you. A lot of studies have found that. But I think what's really, really interesting is when you start digging into the question of, well, is this a causal relationship? Is it due to these opposition movements generating change? Or is it just something uh, spurious? So, for example, the, the existing autocratic regime is, is seen as weak. Uh, and this is why you both have opposition movements then uh, daring to come out in the streets and challenging the regime. And at the same time, you will, you will see that it will evaporate a few years down the line. So it could just be reflecting something about the regime or something about the particular context. Maybe it's just a crisis situation and that, that's when you have opposition movements and the regime dies. Um, so th these are not easy questions to, to answer. Um, I think the, the probably the best answer, if I were to kind of based on the data that we have and the studies that we have, is that this correlation between mass opposition movements and democratization is partially driven by spurious, uh, spurious correlation. So it, it's related to there's something about these contexts that are very shaky. There's a crisis situation, the regime is weak, and then you have the opposition movement. So it's not only causal, but then in addition to that, there's also a causal effect. So whenever you actually see mass mobilization, that increases the chances of uh, the existing regime, especially in autocracies, having to either yield and liberalize from above, enter into negotiations, or that you, have, you see an increased risk of, of a revolution, or that the military, when they see this uh, kind of the mass mobilization in the streets, that they go in and conduct a coup. So you tend to have more regime changes that are uh, basically caused by uh, the opposition uh, uh, coming in place. That, that would be my interpretation. So this is the overall, overall picture. So there's an increased chance of democratization. But what I think is especially interesting is when we start to, uh, to ask questions about, well, does it really matter which type of opposition mobilization we are watching? So does it matter whether it's a violent or a nonviolent movement? So lots and lots of studies have been conducted on, on, on that. And there's a very clear pattern that nonviolent mobilization is related to democratization in a very different way than violent mobilization. So these nonviolent mobilizations, which tend to mobilize large segments of the population, so hundreds of thousands of people uh, onto the streets, they're extremely challenging for dictatorships. The economy grinds to a halt and, and, and you tend to see, tend to see a change. Um, so that's one thing. And the other is, is this kind of, does it matter, uh, for example, uh, which type of social groups that are mobilizing that I'm going to talk about. So now I've, uh, I started to talk a bit already about the next slide. So, so the slide is lagging a bit. It, this is exactly what I mentioned. Uh, a lot of the work, especially then based on Erika Chenovet's Navco data. And there's a fantastic uh, study by uh, Celestine Ongledic, for example, a few years back, that tend to find especially that these non-violent uh, opposition movements, uh, when they enter, and especially when they're large, they tend to be followed by, by democratization. Um, and then, of course, this can happen through a number of, um, a number of different mechanisms. And, and as, as uh, you know, kind of based on, uh, based on the Portuguese case, if we go back to, to 74, 75, you know that these, these different routes that I've put up here, they are not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? You can have coups that are followed by revolutions and, and you can have, uh, as, in, as in neighboring Spain, you can have more transitions and kind of talks be, uh, between the different elites. So you can have multiple processes going on at the same time. But the thing is that if we start looking into the probability of observing uh, a military coup, the probability of observing a revolution or the probability of observing that the regime uh, gets together with the opposition uh, in a closed room and negotiates a deal, a pact of transition to a different, a different regime, you see that the probability of these events all increase in the aftermath of a, of a mass mobilization movement. So it's not necessarily that we, we tend to think of revolutions. That comes very naturally. We think of uh, the people uh, mobilizing in the street and, and the French Revolution, uh, for example, of 1789 or 1848 springs to mind very easily. That's true that that sometimes happens, but 
perhaps even more often, you have these negotiations and these guided transitions. So the old elites have to give way and, and start to negotiate. Um, so there's, there are multiple uh, pathways from uh, mass mobilization to regime change, basically. Um, and this, I just copy pasted in. So this is a, um, a recent ongoing paper that I have with Vilde Juve, who is a postdoc at, at the University of Oslo. Uh, and we are looking into these Navco data on mass mobilizations and combining that with our own data on regime change. So here we have something called we call the historical regimes data, which is part of the varieties of democracy data set, if uh, some of you know VDEM or varieties of democracy. Uh, the data will be there. So we code different ways that regimes break down. And we have several categories of regime change that are related to these incumbent guided transitions. So you have old elites, typically in autocracies, who enter into negotiations or some process of steering regime change. So you start up in, in a more autocratic situation and you can go to a more liberal scenario, or you could just transform the regime into something different. But the old the old autocrat or the old leader is still still in place, but it's it goes, for example, from a from a military regime to a, a party regime or a more personalist autocracy. So there can be different types of of uh, guided transitions, as we call them. And in this paper, we look at um, these mass mobilizations and what what it does to uh, guided transitions of different kinds. And what we find in in particular, uh, so in general, we find a very strong relationship between mass mobilization and these guided transitions. And we find that the, the effect is um, comparable in size to that we, we have on revolutions and coups. So this is a very important channel if you want to understand how mass mobilization spurs change. But then once we start breaking, uh, breaking up the, the data um, and looking into different types of mass mobilization campaigns then separating between the predominantly violent and non-violent ones, and then also separating between those guided transitions that lead to a more liberal regime, so a guided transition towards more democracy, versus self coups and other other types of guided transitions, we tend to see that it's particularly these nonviolent and uh, nonviolent uh, campaigns that tend to lead to uh, guided uh, liberalization episodes. So kind of where you have the old regime elites entering into negotiations. So think, think Spain in the in the 70s, for example. So that's a very, it's a very strong pattern. Uh, but this only happens if the mass mobilization is nonviolent. Once it's violent, um, you tend to see uh, a somewhat higher probability of self coups or other kind of guided transitions that are not democratizing. And the idea there is that I think very often, uh, if you have violent mass mobilization, leaders can often use this to their advantage. So they can say, well, look, there's chaos on the streets. Uh, we need to do something with this violent opposition. You need to give me increased powers. I promise it's only going to be for a month. And I need this, uh, need this uh, period of time to just uh, uh, kind of manage, uh, manage the country. And then it turns into a more, uh, more autocratic regime with, uh, with the leader. Uh, concentrating power in his own hands for for uh, for, it, for eternity, basically, or for a longer period of time. So when you have violent opposition movements, you tend to have these types of more kind of self coups and more autocratic guided transitions. Um, whereas if there are large nonviolent mobilizations, then you tend to get really really big segments of the population mobilizing mobilizing together. So if, if there's a peaceful demonstration out in the street, uh, there are re many regular citizens will, will consider joining. This is something that they can endorse. If there's a violent uh, mobilization out in the streets, many people will refrain and, and sit at home. Um, so I think when you have these large nonviolent mobilizations, then that's when you tend to pressure sitting elites to uh, negotiating for a more democratic uh, regime. Okay. Um, so now I'm going from this. So this study with Ville Juve is, is something we're working on uh, now. It's under it's under review. Uh, so hopefully it will be published <laughs> sometime not in the not too distant future. This paper, the Who Revolts paper, with two of my other colleagues at the University of Oslo, Siriana Dalum and, and Tore Vig, has been published for uh, four years now. So it's from 2019. 
So the idea here is, and I've already mentioned um, mentioned the main logic, we want to go beyond, beyond just looking into this distinction between violent versus nonviolent or large versus small opposition movements, and really look into who is it that organizes these mass mobilization movements. So do they have their, uh, their social basis, so to speak, in some of the large urban groups, the urban middle classes or the urban industrial workers? Or is it based in uh, uh, more in the countryside? So is it uh, mainly the peasants who are dominating or even uh, military em employees, large scale landowners? So we're then going into these uh, um, mass mobilization movements and reading up, up on the history and trying to code which social groups are participating and dominating these, uh, these campaigns. Uh, and to, to give a really quick summary then, um, we find very clearly that who revolts, so basically who are the dominant forces in these mass mobilization movements, matter for the chances of democratization and for the amount of democratization five, seven, ten years down the, down the road. Um, and in particular, we find that uh, when urban industrial workers are the dominating force in these mass mobilization movements, we tend to have more democratic outcomes. And it's a very systematic, it's a very systematic pattern that we find. It's a very robust finding. We also do find that um, when the urban middle classes uh, are the dominating force, we tend to find more democratizing outcomes there as well. But it's not so robust. It's not so systematic across cases. So there are more exceptions to the rules. Um, and for example, if you read the, the literature on, uh, on Latin America, for example, Argentina and Brazil going back into the 60s and 70s, you will see that in some cases, the urban middle classes have incentives to ally with more anti-democratic forces. So it's not always the case that, that the urban middle classes are a pro-democratic force, uh, even though they are uh, probably most, most of the time. Uh, so so our, uh, our argument here is that well, these large urban groups, especially in urbanized societies, um, they're not, I mean, so there can be differences in norms, uh, of course, um, uh, and differences in democratic norms. But even if you take a purely kind of self-interested perspective and look at these groups, they are relatively large and they're kind of well-organized and, and coherent and they have organizations, be it unions for, for the industrial workers or civil society organizations for the middle classes. So they know that they're going to be very effective often in electoral politics, uh, especially in urbanized societies where, where they are numerous. So I think there's an incentive for these groups if you compare them, for example, to large-scale landowners or military, uh, military officers. There's a reason to believe that these large urban groups know that democracy is a system that will benefit their interests, where they can kind of pull the levers 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So they have incentives to fight for democracy in many settings. And in addition to this incentive, they also have the capacity. Um, so they, they both kind of, uh, and especially urban industrial workers, by being organized in unions, they have kind of the infrastructure and apparatus for collective action. So it's easier for them to kind of organize sustained um, mass protests. They have kind of, uh, they, they have the infrastructure for, uh, for coordinating uh, and sustaining these, these protests. So how am I doing on time? Um, you have 22 minutes. Yeah. You have spoken 22 minutes. Okay. So, yep. 10, 15. So ten, I'll, I think we are okay. Yep. If you speak more 10, 15. I'll try to, try to keep it to 10, uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Then, yeah. But in, in short, and the argument then is that um, for different reasons, these urban industrial okay. workers in particular, not only have the incentive to work for a more democratic outcome once they have mobilized, they also have the capacity to sustain this, this mass mobilization, make it a true challenge to the regime, and also by controlling large important parts of the industrial economy. They can also use strikes and, and other kind of economic, typically nonviolent uh, actions to pressure the regime into, into, into giving in. So they're very effective once they, once they mobilize. Okay, um, so basically, um, we talked about, about this. We set this up originally as then a contest that I think there are very good, if you look into, into the macro sociological and historical literature, and especially a lot of case studies conducted on both Europe, Europe historically and Latin America in, in particular. So the uh, 
uh, Ruth Collier, for example, or, or the Rush, uh, Rush, Rush uh, at all uh, books from the early 90s, you will find kind of really detailed, good, um, careful case studies indicating that in many instances, um, uh, urban workers uh, play a democratizing role once, once they mobilize. And then you have other uh, stories also pointing to the, the democratizing role of the urban middle classes. So you have these, you can think of mo uh, modernization theory, for example, going all the way back to the, to the 1950s on kind of the uh, democratizing role of this uh, urban, uh, more educated, uh, middle class living in the cities having particular norms so there's, there's been a large debate in the literature on on who are kind of the most important agents of democratization so this is kind of where we try to to speak to this literature by by looking at um the social composition of these mass mobilization movements and even though we find that the industrial working classes are the most consistently related to uh, democratization we do also find that that the urban middle classes especially if you compare with uh, with peasant dominated mobilization or mobilization dominated by uh, by military officers for example we do also find that they tend to have democratizing roles um so so um so we don't we don't have any kind of super clear stance on on the urban industrial workers being a much much more dem democratizing force than urban classes in all contexts but all we say is that it, it seems from the data that it's a more consistent a consistent picture and the, and the results are very clear for the for the uh, workers all right so i just uh, again um taking out some some uh, tables and plots from the from the paper uh if you're able to see here in the top uh, left corner you can see that the n here these are the uh, number of mass mobilization campaigns that we have been able to code consistently for these different variables so you can see that we have approximately 190 uh, 190 mass mobilization campaigns across the world um, and you can uh, you will also see that the urban middle classes will, uh, according to our data, dominate approximately one fifth of these mass mobilization campaigns, whereas the industrial workers dominate in zero point fifteen, so fifteen percent. And our uh, so the measure that we have for domination is either related to pure numbers, so there, there's clear evidence that one group, one social group, made up a majority of the movement, or uh, we can also code as dominating if they are kind of clearly the leading force in organizing and sustaining uh, the mass mobilization uh, campaign okay okay so i'll i'll then just spend uh, five minutes on uh, on this uh, enormous data collection effort that i'm doing together with several researchers at the peace research uh, sorry peace research institute uh, of oslo prio uh, they are coding um mass uh, opposition movements from 1900 until today and at the university of oslo we have a separate project so my erc project is financing then the coding of historical mass opposition movements going from 1789 to 1900 and we are then coordinating using the same code book and having joint meetings and everything but this is a, a large uh, data collection effort where the idea is that we will want to expand the historical uh, scope of these systematic data so we can use as so we can go beyond kind of uh, um, uh, the many great historical case studies that have been done and try to look for systematic patterns in in these historical data and then we also wanted to expand the number of variables uh, that we have coded uh, so we're uh, we're doing something similar as we did in the who revolts paper by going through and coding the social basis of these different campaigns but we now have a much more uh, refined uh, scheme so we, we expand the number of categories uh, by quite a lot so we have I think 14 categories you can if you have really good eyes you can see them here to the <laughs> to the right of the screen um, so these are just uh, approximately 1500 movements that we have coded so far I guess we'll end up around 1800 1900 when we're all set and done um, and you can here see cum cumulative numbers so to the right these are the global data uh, you can see, um, and the different colors then point to the different dominating social groups behind uh, behind different uh, different campaigns. So you can see we have been able to code around almost twelve hundred of our fifteen hundred campaigns on a particular social group dominating. So it's not always clear from the historical record that there is a dominating group, uh, 
Uh, but then there's a um, there's um, a mix between workers, military employees, students, peasant, intellectuals, professionals, middle classes, agrarian elites, um, and, and we have several um, several more specific working class and and, and, and middle class categories. Um, so you can see uh, from this figure, I would say uh, both the uh, um, kind of. This is a very clear historical pattern. You can see see an increase through, throughout time, um, but also that there's huge variety in terms of which social the social group basis of these movements uh, uh, differ a lot. So here is the dominating groups, but we also have um, measures that uh, capture participation, where we're trying to look at different constellations and coalitions of different social groups, uh, and look at kind of the evolution of those through history. Uh, we see some extremely interesting patterns there in terms of more recent groups being kind of broader kind of let's call them rainbow coalitions covering very many social groups so tend to tend to have more narrower distinct coalitions back in back in the days um here uh, and in addition to going back to 1789 and, and trying to recode and do do a better even better job of, of coding some of the things that we have been interested in earlier we try to code new uh, new variables so for example we're coding a more refined measure of the explicit goals of these different campaigns, so not only if they want regime change or lead the change, but also which particular civil liberties, for example, they would like to, to change. Is it a demand for political equality or redistribution, for example? So we're, try, we're trying to code the campaign goals. Uh, and we're then not coding uh, those campaigns that only want the policy change. So that's insufficient for us to code them. There need needs to be either regime change, leader change, uh, secession, so so basically something related to autonomy, or then major institutional change related to elections or civil liberties protection, something something of that kind. Um, we also try to code um, uh, ideology, so this is extremely different, uh, difficult. So, is there a kind of evidence from speeches from uh, from their documents of any kind of explicit link to a particular ideology? Uh, communism, socialism, for example, fascism, uh, nationalism, uh, liberalism. So we have these different kind of large, broad categories that we try to, to call different campaigns after. And then we're looking into to characteristics such as uh, organization and, and size and so on. So in, the, in this figure, uh, we show that the, the share of uh, uh, campaigns cumulatively through uh, modern history that has uh, some kind of organization participating. It's a civil society organization or a political party that increases dramatically. Today, almost all uh, kind of sustained mass uh, mobilization campaigns have some organization participating. That was not all, always true historically. But when it comes to another uh, aspect of organization, so whether there's a coherent leadership for the mass mobilization movement, uh, we actually find a decline. So, so they become more fragmented in recent years. These social uh, mobilization uh, social movements uh, so you can think for example uh, at the present day of, of kind of large spontaneous uh, social media driven mobilizations for example without any clear uh, head <laughs> so to speak no no clear uh, coherent leadership here's uh, and and i should stop uh, i have this and, and then one more slide uh, but this uh, speaks to the uh, whether campaigns are predominantly violent or non-violent. So we're trying to track this. So you can see here that early on in history from, from the late 18th century, you could see that the cumulative number of violent campaigns was much higher than of non-violent campaigns. So we're able to register and code a lot more violent mass mobilization movements going back in time. Whereas once we've passed the Second World War, you see that the nonviolent movements start to increase. And at this point in time in our database, we have recorded more nonviolent and violent movements. Uh, so, so this really means that in the last few years, the spread of nonviolent mass mobilization movements has been enormous, um, clearly dominating the violent, violent ones. And that was not always the case historically. But I should note that this could be kind of a substantive change in how mass mobilization movements operate and what tactics they use. But it could also be something more uh, funky going on met methodologically. So it's easier for us to pick up violent campaigns going back in time in historical sources because they are so visible, they are so high profile, people are getting shot and killed, right? Whereas maybe we, we are missing peaceful protests.
uh, going back in time. Whereas in recent years with, uh, with the internet uh, and, and uh, lots and lots of sources, it's easier for us to pick up on these non-violent campaigns. My best guess is that both of this, uh, these things are going on at the same time. There is this methodological issue. It's easier to pick up these non-violent protests now. But I also do believe, this is only my belief, that it's related to a substantively changing trend that there, are, there is more non-violent mobilization today than, than there was in, in the early 1800s. Uh, so I, I do think it's it's partly substantive, and this is just then uh, what I, I think I promised would be the uh, the final slide, uh, just showing uh, different ideologies as we we call them. Um, so you can see democracy and human rights ideologies have become extremely pre uh, prevalent among um, mass mobilization movements over the last couple of decades, whereas nationalism has been a very kind of consistently always been there as, as one, the, one of the most important ideologies of mass mobilization movements across the world. So uh, to sum up, uh, whenever you see uh, sustained uh, groups of people out in the streets, either protesting peacefully or waging a, waging a guerrilla war, basically, when you have these mass mobilization movements, you tend to have a higher probability of democratization, but it, it then really matters uh, exactly what type of mobilization you have uh, is, is important uh, for, for getting better predictions on, on democracy. Especially uh, non-violent movements seem to be related to uh, more democratic outcomes. And the larger the movement is, uh, the more effective they are also in, in engendering regime change and, and democratization. The final thing that matters is the identity of those mobilizing. And, and we find especially strong indications that urban industrial workers, when they dominate these mass mobilization movements, we tend to have more democratic outcomes. But then uh, the last word, I guess, is not uh, not spoken about these, these issues. Uh, it's a relatively new research field, a quantitative study at least. Uh, kind of, there's been excellent case studies going on for, for a long time, but the quantitative studies have then come with Erika Chenovet's data. Now there, there have been several new data collection efforts. We are trying to add to this by coding mass mobilization back to 1789 using historical sources and then try to kind of incorporate more uh, historical knowledge in, in the study of mass mobilization and, and democratization. So, so thank, thank you for your patience. Your thank you so much. And thank you for the people that are online, the colleagues. Thank you for attending. Thank you to Milena and all the people here at the Centro de Estudos Globais. And thank you the colleagues that uh, have been here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.